I generally call my talks, and I've done nearly 150 of them in the two years I've been doing this job, to a total of about, I don't know, 14,000 people or something. And I generally give my talks that title there, or something like it, because I actually do think this is the big challenge for our generation of school leaders. No previous generation of school leaders in England has managed substantially to close the gap between the attainment of poorer pupils and others. And if we can use the pupil premium to do that, I actually think we should be remembered as the best generation of school leaders ever. And the acronym that I like to give school audiences is that. VIP, V for values, because it seems to me there's nothing like pupil premium to play to our values as educators, to our moral <coughs> purpose as school leaders and teachers. And I have to say, I would much rather use moral purpose as an incentive than financial incentives to help people to really address this agenda. I for innovation, because there's nothing like pupil premium to give you the opportunity to be innovative, to be creative, and to do what you think is appropriate for your particular school in your circumstances. Nobody is telling you what to do. And P, for partnership, because I'll say right at the end, I think there are enormous opportunities, and you've heard the kind of work that Sharon Hollows is doing, having won the national award this year in terms of dissemination, massive opportunities to work in partnership with other schools, even though the answers that you come up with at the end of the day might, uh, might be different. I'm just going to give you a flavour of the kind of thing that I say to school audiences, starting with the emphasis that this is an agenda about raising achievement, if anything, even more than closing uh, the gap about excellence and equity. And because I used to be a maths teacher and I like to see things in graphs, what I try to do is to give people that image to take away from conferences. The blue line, which is about raising achievement and going on raising achievement of the non-pupil premium youngsters, and the red line, raising the achievement of the pupil premium youngsters, that bit faster so that the gap closes. But that sets it in the context more of a raising achievement agenda than a closing uh, the gap agenda. Where should schools put uh, their focus? Well, the first thing is not simply to look at the gap between your own pupil premium youngsters and your own non-pupil premium youngsters. It's important to do that, it's important to keep track of that, but it's much more important, I think, to keep track of the gap between your pupil premium youngsters and uh, the national non-pupil premium youngsters to give yourself, in the case of most schools, a more challenging focus uh, against which to judge your, your progress. And what I try to do is to help schools to raise their ambition about what's possible. Something like one in six schools, I'm not sure that figure's exactly right, but something like one in six, one in seven schools, the attainment of the free school meals kids is better than the average attainment for all children nationally. That shows it can be done. And I, I hope to inspire people to raise their ambition of what is possible with these youngsters, using the evidence of what's available, using curriculum actually to help to um, uh, design a curriculum that, uh, that benefits, particularly benefits disadvantaged youngsters, but never, never, never to lose the focus on the quality of teaching and learning. Because we know from the Sutton Trust report of 2011 that if you have poor teaching in your school, and that's a graph that I always use at my conferences, uh, that if you have poor teaching in your school, that disproportionately holds back deprived children. And equally, the flip side of that coin, fortunately, is true, and that is that if you have excellent teaching in your school, that disproportionately benefits deprived children. And that is why it is perfectly legitimate to use pupil premium money for quality first teaching to raise the quality of teaching and learning in your, uh, in your school. Now, that's the process that in the course of doing this work for two years and learning so much about what goes on in the kind of schools that Claire uh, and Sharon uh, run, uh, in the schools that are successful with pupil premium, that is the process that, they, that I, they go through. And I don't go around the country telling people what to do in their individual schools, but I do go around telling people how to go about it. And as I see it, that is how to go about it, starting with the barriers to learning. And what happened, you see, when we first got pupil premium in 2011, 2012, this took a couple of years to really get going. People just kind of threw the money at the things that they felt in their guts would, would do the trick. 
without using, without using the evidence, but more importantly, in my view, without really examining the barriers to learning for the youngsters in their school or thinking about what they wanted to achieve with that money, the desired outcomes uh, and the success criteria. And it seems to me that only when you've done that are you in a position to decide what are the right strategies for you to put in place in your school, to choose those strategies, to then organise the training in depth um, uh, to put those strategies in place effectively and then to keep them under regular evaluation and to report on them, what I call the audit trail, to report on them uh, mainly on the, uh, on the website. If you take this barriers to learning seriously, I got this from a school in, in Hertfordshire, in fact, half a dozen different things that you can do properly to research the barriers to learning for the pupils in your school because one of the things I think it's really important to remember in all of this is there's no such thing as a typical pupil premium child. Actually, there are just so many different individuals with so many different barriers to learning and so many different needs. And you need to get in there and find out what those are and then put the strategies and interventions in place that will help those children to overcome them. So it's worth spending some time actually doing, uh, doing that. And then thinking about, OK, those are the barriers to learning. Now, what do we want to achieve? What, if you like, are our desired outcomes with the pupil premium funding? And I've listed 10 things there that you might have as examples on a list. And some schools will cross some of those out and put other ones in. But then, if you're going to spend money trying to achieve those desired outcomes, it seems to me to be really important to define the success criteria, to set your own goals. Not, this, these aren't things that Ofsted are going to judge you on, on the whole. Most of them are things that you want to do because you want to turn around the lives of the disadvantaged children in your school. So you set your own success criteria there. And some of those might have numbers against them. Top one, for example, might have you want to get it from X percent in 2015 to Y percent in 2016 to Z percent in 2017. Accelerating progress, I think that's uh, an example of something where, and I still use this lovely phrase, every child matters. And I'd set the goal there would be something like every pupil premium child to make at least good, uh, good progress. But when you do that exercise to barriers to learning, most of the areas that, get, that I find that schools will define there as being barriers to learning for their disadvantaged youngsters actually come into the three categories towards the bottom. A lack of engagement of families and parents with the education of their children. Um, a lack of opportunity to develop skills and personal qualities which their more fortunate peers have and a narrower range of opportunities in their, in their lives. And you then have a really rich conversation about what you might put for success criteria there on the right-hand side uh, before you start to think about the strategies that you're going to put in place to engage parents better and to broaden the opportunities uh, that, the, uh, that the children uh, have. Then, as I say, and only then, are you in a position, it seems to me, to decide on the strategies that you want to put in place. Bearing in mind that this is an individual pupil agenda, but that there are, within the pupil premium group, some really important subgroups. And I would identify looked after children as one of those groups. Now I've got a slide that illustrates a whole lot of statistics about looked after children. Only 12% of looked after children. Leo care leavers get five A to C's with English and maths compared with 35% of pupil premium youngsters and 64% of non-pupil premium youngsters. So that, that is absolutely, is it not, at the core of our moral purpose to help those most disadvantaged ch of children to achieve, uh, to, achieve, um, uh, to achieve better. So you think about the strategies that will help you to achieve those desired outcomes, use evidence of what works, and apply it appropriately to your situation. The only skill I ever claimed to have as a head teacher was pinching ideas from other places and putting them into um, action at, at Durham Johnson, but crucially, adapting them to the context of my own school. And that seems to me to be an innovative approach. There aren't many of us who actually have had wholly original ideas in our, in our professional career. In fact, if you've had one, it's probably above average. But there are two strategies that I do point out to people. Those ones in blue there. 
Because every really successful pupil pre at school that I've come across with pupil premium does those two things. They monitor the progress of pupils very frequently. They don't use the word regularly there. They don't do it once a term or something. Because kids can drift for 10 weeks if you do that. They do it very frequently. And when they find that youngsters are starting to drift, they put their interventions in place rapidly, immediately. You don't say, come along for some extra math tuition in three weeks' time. You say, come along at lunchtime today. So uh, keeping those things under regular review is important too. And we produced um, a, 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 a guide, originally written actually, for the, uh, published by the Teaching Schools Council, originally written for people who are doing external pupil premium reviews, but deliberately written in a way in which they can be used for internal school uh, self-review of how well you're doing with the pupil premium. And that, I think, is a really useful document to help you evaluate uh, your strategies and, of course, the very useful Families of Schools database from, pupil, from the uh, Education Endowment Foundation, which we very much look forward to seeing the primary version of in, uh, in, the, uh, in the autumn. And then finally, reporting on this well on your website. And even schools that are, that's just a, a kind of easy template to, uh, to, to do this. But even schools that are really very successful with pupil premium don't always do well on that right-hand column don't always report impact adequately. And it's not too difficult to do it. If you take one-to-one -one tuition, you say who's in charge, you're spending £5,000 on it or whatever it is, you describe how you're evaluating the effectiveness of that one-to-one -one tuition, and then you describe the impact along the lines of, well, the children having one-to-one -one tuition have made such and such progress since that tuition started compared with so-and-so that they were making before. You can describe the impact of these things. Some of them, of course, are more difficult to describe the impact of. Uh, some of the, the, the strategies around engaging parents and so on. And equally, there may be some students whose individual needs are so great that you have a whole, a whole menu of, of strategies and interventions that you're putting in place. A theory of marginal gains, if you like where you can't just ascribe an individual strategy to an, individual, to an improvement of an individual child. And what I say about that is, this is about turning around the lives of individual children. It's not simply about statistics. So use case studies. And if you've got enough of these children to sufficiently anonymise their case studies, put it on your website. If you don't, still do keep those case studies, but keep them in your Pupil Premium Impact uh, folder, because it's a really important way that you can demonstrate yourselves putting the ethos of your school into, into action. And Pupil Premium, the VIP, the I of VIP, Pupil Premium is a great opportunity for innovation on the basis uh, of evidence. The government is not telling you how to close the gap. It's giving you the money, it's holding you to account for the impact what you do in between is up to you. It's for you to decide. So my mantra on this is stop looking up, as we have done in incre in increasingly over the last 25 years, as we've been told in increasingly mind-numbing detail about curriculum and testing and even how to teach. Stop looking up because nobody's going to tell you how to do this pupil premium agenda. It's up to you and start looking out to the evidence of what is available. And the three places to look out to. The first one is schools like Claire's and Sharon's that are doing this successfully, particularly the Pupil Premium Awards website. Part of winning a Pupil Premium Award is that you've ticked a box to say, yes, we will use this money to help other schools. And you heard that directly from Sharon uh, earlier. So it's perfectly OK to pick up the telephone, get in touch with these schools, find out what they're doing, go and visit them uh, and learn from them. Using the Education Endowment Foundation Toolkit, of course, a very, very powerful help here. And finally, uh, the specific Ofsted survey in February 2013, uh, which was a particularly valuable summary of successful and less successful approaches to, um, uh, to the use of, of pupil premium. And when you've done that and you've put the strategies in place and you're evaluating them, you're using the evidence... Don't then think about this separately from your central school improvement. Think of pupil premium. Don't worry about the words on the right. Think about the, 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 the green diagram, which illustrates beautifully how pupil premium policies are, a, are, a, are a embedded within 
your school improvement. You haven't, don't have pupil premium plan it over here and plan it school improvement over here. This is embedded within that. That's how to see it. And this is why it's such a key <coughs> to, um, to, <coughs> to, making, uh, to making a difference in your school. I want to talk just for, for uh, I want you to think for just a moment about accountability in a completely different light here. We've come to regard accountability as something rather nasty done to us by Ofsted and, and league tables and so on. And very often it's not been intelligent accountability. On the pupil premium, it's so much part of the core of what we want to do as school leaders that it seems to me that this is something that we could use accountability creatively, use it constructively, build our own data sets to determine whether we are achieving the success criteria on that previous slide that we have set for ourselves. So we begin to take more ownership of accountability and we use the pupil premium agenda uh, to do it. And I think those success criteria uh, give you the way in which you, can, in which you can do that. I think we can use curriculum too. I mean, as chair of whole education, what we're talking about there is giving all young people a fully rounded education of the sort, frankly, that you take for granted if you pay 30000 a year and send your sons to Eton. You, you pay for that fully rounded education. I think disadvantaged children deserve that too. And I think that if you do that, if you have that kind of whole education approach, then you will disproportionately benefit the young people who do not get the opportunity to develop their skills and personal qualities in the way that their more fortunate peers do. So think about ways in which you can um, uh, design a curriculum that does most for disadvantaged uh, youngsters. And finally, just think about the challenge of dissemination in terms of, of macro um, uh, pupil premium policy and making an effect not just in your individual school, but as a country uh, as a whole. There's near universal support for pupil premium. I, I have detected, particularly in the last 18 months, a massively increased willingness to use evidence and to go out there and find out and bring it back into, your, uh, into people's own school. We've had some success so far, particularly at primary, we need to build on it. The evidence is these things take time to embed in schools. So it seems to me a critical question for policy at the moment is less about how you change the policy and much more about how you uh, disseminate the best possible practice in the education of disadvantaged youngsters. There are plenty of bodies up for this. The Education Endowment Foundation, obviously. Teaching schools are massively up for it. Um, so are local authorities, academy chains, Ofsted and regional school commissioners ought to be involved in this too. And I just do wonder if we ought to be thinking about how we can create regional capacity to take the, this agenda forward in a really, really constructive way. That is my email address. I am really ashamed of having a DfE email address after 20 <laughs> years of uh, rubbishing government policy in my last job. But anyway, there you go. It's got the word champion in it, so it's not quite so bad. Um, I put quite a lot of information on Twitter about, about Pupil Premium and a kind of summary of what I have said this morning is on that blog there. So thank you very much. Whatever you do, whatever your role is with these disadvantaged ch children, good luck with it. You could not be doing anything more important. Thank you. Thank you.